Hello, I want to give you a lecture that is fairly narrowly focused this week because it's an important moment that defines race relations and the status of African Americans in American society to this day. There is this moment when for the first time <clears throat> you have a large number of slaves on plantations that are suddenly under the control of Union troops. I'm talking about the Sea Islands. The Sea Islands are on the, off the coast, rather, of several states on the Atlantic seaboard, uh, starting with Virginia and all the way down to Florida. And these are special places for the history of slavery for a number of reasons. First, they're on the coast, they're among the first places where you have plantations at all. So it's the oldest, part of the oldest, um, here of slavery. Second, the cotton that is grown there in this sea adjacent climate, the sea island cotton is actually a separate category of higher quality. So if you're going to be farming cotton, you get to, to grow the short staple cotton in those places um, that is very desirable in the markets, as opposed to the long staple cotton that grows away from the sea which has the nasty seeds in it where you need the cotton gin to remove them. And yet what you receive at the end is still an inferior kind of cotton. Um, so this is huge, huge money-making operations. And slavery there goes back for hundreds of years. Um, and suddenly, and another reason why these places are special is because of their strategic importance. The Sea Islands, control access to rivers and ports. And the North is trying to choke off the Confederacy by blockading these ports. In order to do that, it helps if you have a basis on land where you can set up your guns. So um, the islands that you read about in your documents are located off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, and they control access to that part. So the Union goes in early on to set up base on these islands and to hold on to them so they can better blockade the port. And as emancipation unfolds, this is Southern territory. This is territory that is under Confederate government, but Northern under Union occupation, the people on the plantations are among the few that are actually freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. But even before that, um, the Union commanders in charge of those places, at one point that is General Sherman, who is famous for burning Atlanta to the ground, if you've seen Gun with the Wind. Um, he's a strong, and, and the reason they hate him in the South, because he was against slavery from the beginning, and he consistently took the side of the slaves. Um, so even before emancipation, and even more so than Butler in Virginia, um, Sherman makes sure that the slaves, even while they're still slaves, get opportunities to work for wages, to get their own land, uh, whatever you can accomplish. Now, of course, as people working for the government uh, of the North, of the Union, of Lincoln, the representatives of the army have to represent that government. And its goal in capturing parts of the Southern territory, other than military aims, is when you have these plantations, do produce cotton because you desperately need cotton in the North for the factory. Somebody has to make the cloth that becomes part of the uniforms that your soldiers are going to wear. But because the government is also in the business of enforcing the law of the land, you have to respect property rights. That's what the government is all about. So you can't just go in and take away the land or the slaves. However, in these cases where the masters have up and left, you're also looking at simply human beings who have been abandoned by their masters who used to be in charge of them. So what are you going to do because how are they going to sustain themselves? What are they going to eat? Um, what will they do all day long? So all these things come together in the project of 
declaring these plantations with their slaves abandoned property and say, we're going to take them over. The government will take them over and will administer them, step into the role the slaveholder used to play, but in distinction, not treat them as slaves, but assume they are going to be wage workers, agricultural laborers. Now, the freedmen, of course, see this as a form of liberation. They are no longer slave, slaves for all practical purposes. <coughs> and what they want to accomplish after the union freed them, they want to keep it that way. And if you've read the documents, you'd see that these superintendents, the people who are in charge of managing the plantations for the Union Army, who are brought in, use that to their advantage because they try to get the labor as cheap as possible. And if the freed people complain, one of these superintendents will say, well, do you want to be slaves again? Or do you want to work for very low wages? What's it gonna be? You want us to bring back the guy with the whip? And on the assumption that the people he's talking to lack the information to judge that what he's doing is bluffing, um, is going to assume they'll, they'll comply. They'll go back to work for no money or very little money. Nonetheless, the freedmen do want to make a living. And after everything they've seen in the South, and after what they're experiencing now with Northern whites who come in to be their managers, they are really convinced that white people are going to look at them in a certain way that just assumes that they can't do their own thing and they can't succeed on their own. So if you're going to work for wages for a white person, you're always going to get the short end of the stick. If you really want to be able to show what you can do and how good you are at what you do, you do need to have your own farm. And that is the main point what the free people want. They want to be independent cotton farmers, owners of their own land and not having to depend economically on anybody, especially not on white people who may be trying to take advantage of. But there is plenty of overlap between these two groups, interest groups, the Northern uh, government, the Union Army, and the freed people. Both really want to defeat the Confederates. Both really want to make sure that slavery doesn't come back. And the North, too, to justify how now this is a war to free the slaves, needs to prove what the slaves themselves also want to prove, that they can be hard workers, that they can function in a free market as independent producers. In other words, that the racial stereotype that brands them as lazy, incompetent, deceitful, and so forth is not true. But at the same time, while there is this shared goal, the level of pay, as you see in the documents, it's a huge point of contention. Um, and the question of land ownership is too. Many people in the North are sitting on packed bags and wads of cash. And they're just waiting to go South and to buy a plantation, to hire the free people as cheap labor and to become the new Lords of the cotton fields. These Northern business people you can also see in the sources are already making an impact. This Mr. Philbrick, who you read about is a classical example. He is deceitful. He is coming in and saying, well, work for me. You can't buy the land now. I bought your land, your old plantation land in, in an auction. If you work for me for wages for a year, I paid a dollar an acre for your plantation. If you work for me for a year, I will resell the land for you. You can pay me that money with the wages you made for me. And after the year is over, he says, I never said that. And if I was going to sell, it would be $10 an acre. Turns out the land is worth much more. Now this, of course, while the free people understand that under the laws in the North, contracts are absolute. As, as well as property rights. And of course, contracts are the legal form that property rights take when property exchanges, uh, changes hands, when it is exchanged on the market. Um, so <clears throat> if 
Mr. Philbrick is now the owner and he doesn't want to sell to you, that's that. You might be able to lobby the government and say, but in fact, the original sale to him, that contract was based on false premises, on false um, assumptions. So can you invalidate that perhaps? But while the free people understand how contract works and how the law works in relation to property, they also have a sense of fairness that is much about that moral economy of old, where they're basically arguing that if we do all the work and if we do lots of work, and in fact, if we do not much else than work, should we not be able to enjoy a livelihood? Should we not be able to live comfortably at our station as farmers, no longer as slaves, and should we not maybe also be able to improve ourselves, possibly to buy land one day? So in this sense, <coughs> if you look at the free people who are going to the superintendent and are saying, can we please have some clothes and some salt which we need for our diet? Payment in kind is one of those things that happens in a traditional moral economy. And it's also about the specific needs, because even if you do have the money, you can't go out and buy salt and clothing in the agricultural South because there are no country stores. Everything that comes in is bought by the master for his slaves. Now the master is gone and the slaves are free to people, but there is still no store. So um, you have to rely on the person who pays you and manages the plantation to get your hands on these things. And that's a matter of livelihood. All the money in the world wouldn't mean that you could get your hands on salt and clothing because it simply doesn't, nobody is selling that in these islands, nobody is making that. And this tension, of course, um, in this tension between attitudes of moral economy and fairness versus awareness of contracts and, and, and property law and so forth. Um, in, in being aware of that, the free people are also showing that they know and can function in a marketplace. Consider Don Carlos Rutte, one of the documents here. Um, <clears throat> in his letter to Lincoln, explaining why he wants his own land. It's the same situation, except it's only him and Phil Brick's plantation, but many more slaves. Master up and left. Don Carlos has been managing the farm. He has a nice crop of cotton growing. He has a business plan. He is saying, I can pay off all the money I, I borrowed. I can increase production, I can hire somebody, I can take care of my son who is disabled um, if I make 25 cents a bale for that cotton, and that's lowballing it. I mean, he's gonna make more. So he, he knows what to expect in the marketplace. Uh, he knows what, what yield he's looking at. So he's ready to go as an independent farmer. And he knows that all around him, the plantations that were managed by black people like him, after the masters abandoned them, have been sold by the caretakers, by the government, to private owners who were white people from the north, who then turned the black ex-slaves that had been working and managing the land back into underpaid wage servants, wage slaves, essentially. So who are these people, these new southern landowners? They have no background in slavery and they have no interest in maintaining slavery. They are, in many cases, among the most advanced progressive abolitionists who have a long history of giving money to the abolitionist movement, of backing the Republican Party, within the Republican Party, of backing candidates who speak out strongly against slavery, all of that, of course, not so much because they're interested in the livelihood of Southern Blacks, but rather because they have a mess almost messianic belief in the moral superiority of free labor, of paying people wages, 
to get them to do work on the assumption that the inherently um, lazy working people will yield the most productivity if only they have to work really, really hard and long hours for little money or else they'll just be lazy. And of course, as you recall from my lecture about slavery, the worst kind of laziness is what you get in slavery because the slaves have no monetary incentive whatsoever to do any work. All the work they do is because they are being coerced. So these Northern business people turn out as a new class of Southern landowners in many ways to be nastier than the slaveholders because where the slaveholders still had the somewhat disingenuous claim, we are taking care of our people, these Northern businessmen no longer even claim that. So they're free to pay people wages as a way of exploiting them. But if you want free labor, and I explained that this doesn't mean to work for free, but this is about labor performed by people who are legally free because they own their own person. They're free to enter into contracts. Marx pointed out that if, if you're going into the marketplace to buy labor as a commodity, to, to pay somebody to sell you his ability to work, your prospective worker has to be doubly free. He has to be free to enter into contracts, a free man with rights that are equal to yours, but he also has to be free from ownership of the means of production. He has to be free from the ability to make a living otherwise. He has no land, no tools, no workshop, no capital to acquire any of these things. So he is free from the ability to make a living by other means than to work for somebody for wages. Which means that if you want the freed people, the ex-slaves in the South, to become wage workers, you really have to make sure that they're not just free in legal terms, but they're also free from the ability to make a living on their own. So you really can't let them have the land. And that is the main goal of the Northern business people who make up an important part of the Republican Party. So as employers, as the new landowner, as the new economic ruling class of the South, <coughs> these Northerners take advantage of the free, uh, they screw them over, pardon my French, when they ever, whenever they get the chance, as you saw in the sources. Um, they very quickly adapt the racist view of the old plantation owners, of the lazy and deceitful freed people. Um, they confront them with this ideology of frugality, discipline, and work ethic that works so well in northern industry. And they're saying, well, if you don't want to work for these wages, if you don't want to do it under our terms and watch us make all the money from your labor, maybe you're just too lazy. And of course, they're the main group that works in the federal government as well as on the ground in the South to sabotage and resist land reform. So when the Republican Congress, uh, the radical Republicans in Congress fail to get through Congress, the law known as 40 acres and a mule, which would have given every freedman 40 acres of land and a mule and would have set them up to be independent farmers economically sustainable, ready to go with all the skills and whatnot. When that failed, it was because this part of the Republican Party, the business people, sabotaged it and made sure it didn't go through. Now, what do the free people do in response? Part of it is, of course, um, what are they going to do? Once they become voting citizens, they join the Republican Party, naturally. This is the political party that freed them. Um, what are the, the Democratic Party in the South goes from being the party of the slaveholders to being the party of the racists, of the Ku Klux Klan, later on of the segregationists. But what do the free people want politically? 
Why do they join a party? What do they want the government to do? Essentially, they want the government to level the economic playing field. They do not want, they have never, the free people have never had the chance to build up capital. Anything they did, any value they created, went straight into the pockets of the master. No other immigrant group had that kind of experience. Even if you arrived like the Irish with nothing, nonetheless, if you did manage to save up something, you did get to keep them, not so the slaves. So not only are they getting in at the very ground level, they're getting in into a free society already predispised as the worst people um, in terms of their you know, racial prejudice. And they're facing an aggressive group of people, these Northern industrialists with lots of money and all the political connections. So when the free people say, please won't the government make sure that we, at least those of us who have the money, get to buy the plantation land that we work on, um, they run into a wall with it. And when they use labor tactics like work stoppages or slowdowns to put out pressure to say, well, you want us to work for you, at least pay us well or we won't work for you. We know you need us to work for you. They get branded as rebel rousers, as lazy, as ungrateful, and so forth. So to the new masters, what the freed people in the South are doing, here really mirrors what they have been seeing in the North since the 1820s, where a similar, a similar story unfolded. If you remember, artisans, craftsmen in the North used to call their bosses masters and lived under the same roof, they were part of the family. They were not really free to leave not the same as slavery, but also a traditional arrangement, kind of like slavery. Then this was replaced with industrialization and wage labor in the North. The master said, get out of my house, find your own apartment. I no longer pay all your bills. I give you a wage. If that isn't enough, too bad, not my problem. And to that, Northern workers responded by saying, first, under our traditional assumptions about livelihood and fairness, we have rights. We, owe, we are owed respect. We're the backbone of the Republic. We do all the work. So we're going to strike and we're going to use the right to vote to make sure that we have some means of fighting back <coughs> against this declassment. And now, for the Northern working class, this took about 20 years for them to catch up, to say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? What are they doing to us? The free people take two years at most to catch up to the realities of being a working class in a free market. So they're, they're smart, they're adaptable, um, and they certainly are catching on quickly. That scares the Republican elite in the North because now it looks they don't just have the rebellious northern working class to deal with, who are forming unions, trying to elect candidates that give them what access to clean water in the cities and education. Now you have the same thing going on in the south. What would happen to freedom and property rights if these two groups, unlikely though it is, the northern white working class and the southern free people would ever discover that they have a common enemy and a common interest. So in the North, as part of the strategic response to this challenge to the power of Northern capital in the South, you get a backlash. The backlash is in the name of the sanctity of contract and property against the interference of government in the markets. Um, so yes, we waged a war to pull out by its root the economic system of the South, thereby annihilating one class of property that was the biggest class of property in the country, plantation land and slaves. Never mind of that fact. And of course, that during the war, the government 
made some people very rich through defense contracts and land grants to the railroads in particular. <coughs> Nonetheless, now that the free people are saying, please, Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Federal Government, won't you make sure that they don't trick us out of every last acre of land down here? We're going to say, wait, this is now over. No more government interference in the market. And if you are asking the government to do anything for you, we will call you lazy and corrupt. And so this becomes the, the catch-22 that has been so familiar since then. The first assumption is if you have the right attitude, you will succeed in the free market. If you do not succeed in the free market, that must therefore be because you don't have the right attitude. And whose fault is that? So then if you go and make a demand, for instance, for political or economic rights, or to be protected of predatory behavior by those who have more economic power than you do, you only show that you don't have the right attitude because you didn't have to make demands if you were doing well in the market, would you know? So that shows that once you have to ask for help, you probably don't deserve it. You most likely don't deserve it. And this becomes, this is rooted, of course, um, or anchored rather on the assumption that look, most of the people who are asking for government to help them don't look like you. Have you noticed how they're slightly darker skinned? Yes, you have. See, that's why they are not doing so well in the market because they really don't have that kind of attitude you do. You roll up your sleeves and go right to work, see? Now, this bringing back racism on this basis, um, allowing really the plantation racism of the South to, to, to jump the parameter of the plantation and escape unharmed into the North, take root there and grow and flourish, um, that is not unchallenged. Of course, there are people who are calling this out and saying what you're doing here is you're, you're pre preserving and giving a pass to the old plantation attitude of workers as lazy. Um, and some of the people who are the most vocal in resisting this racist backlash in the North are the former soldiers of the Union Army because they are the ones who had been interacting with their black counterparts who've been moving around in plantation territory and been meeting people there. And they, from their own experience, were able to provide arguments against racism. Um, who, because they had risked their lives to free the slaves, had a personal commitment to equality, to really make sure that after the war, the United States didn't squander what they had fought for and, and fall back once again in a racial, racialized society that is not based on equality. But the tragedy with this is that there are not that many Civil War soldiers, or at least they don't have the bullhorn that Northern Capital has, who have all the money all the journalists write for papers that are financed by them. And of course, they bought and paid for the Republican Party from day one. So it's a very, it's a very, an uneven fight. And in this fashion, <coughs> the perspective of the carpetbaggers, which is to say these Northern business people and their agents who go to the South and take over the land becomes the official version of what's going on there in the north. Suddenly, laziness, deceitfulness, and corruption, what used to be just about slaves, however, now becomes about workers in general. And you can still make it about race because in the north, the next generation of industrial workers who come in happen to be from Ireland, Italy, Romania, Greece, and all those places that 
where you'd never seen anybody like them in this country and clearly they didn't belong here, they probably were also unfit for hard work, independence, freedom, and the right to vote. Um, so that is how racism comes back with the vengeance in the North. It attaches itself, it, it, it flourishes because it suit, the narrative suits the economic interest of Northern capital. There is also a problem that is significant and helps you understand the documents this week um, of how the do-gooders, how the emancipators, how the abolitionists tick. Not to diss all of them, but there is a particular brand of patronizing emancipator, of do-gooder, who likes to, um, to advocate for the lesser people, for the poor, unfortunate people, simply because um, they like being the ones who are more fortunate and who can then go and do good, granting rights to lesser races, and will, who, who will then get very uncomfortable once these ingrates of the lesser races actually start using their rights and voicing their own opinions and challenging assumptions about them, including the hierarchy. Because at that point, even many of these do-gooders start to fear for their top spot in the racial hierarchy. So the part of the abolitionist movement that wasn't committed to anti-racism so much, that hadn't really worked through that, is very um, susceptible to, to completely flipping and becoming viciously racist when suddenly the people who used to be their charges grow up to become adults with their own interests. Um, one more irony here, by the way, um, in these schools in the South set up by the Northern government, one of the people who goes to teach there is a guy named George Fitzhugh. Yes, that George Fitzhugh. And, and so he goes on to become a school teacher when his books don't sell anymore, um, teaching blacks of all ages to read and write and that's how he starts acquiring some, some doubts about his view of the inferiority of Africans. It's an interesting transformation. Um, <clears throat> we'll pursue this train of thought, however. It was my main argument here, that racism revives after the Civil War courtesy of the economic interest of the Northern ruling class of capital. Um, in our last session of the semester next week, mm. because once you start assuming that not all men are created equal, you can also start rolling back equal rights, especially the right to vote. So um, no sooner has racism gained a new lease on life in North and South and become even nastier than it had been in the Civil War and before the Civil War in the South, then that you get a general rejection of democracy in the North in the 1870s. Suddenly people who are not just saying, oh, I wish, you know, who have bias remorse, who are saying, I wish we hadn't given the right to vote to these Blacks, but who are also saying, maybe we shouldn't be giving working people the right to vote after all. When we started doing that in the 1820s, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. We've tried this for 40, 50 years, maybe it's time to stop doing that. Um, so one way this was, a, was possible to do is of course, if your working class is coming from abroad as immigrants, if you change immigration laws to make it harder for people to become citizens and therefore voters um, say, if you can, stretch the time until naturalization to 10 years, and the average immigrant comes into your country at age 20, um, then the bulk of your working class at the height of their productivity is going to be non-voting. Um, so this is what, if you can't take away the right to vote from people who already have it, 
at least you can try to stack the deck against other people who might vote the wrong way. So that's that for this week. Um, thanks for listening. And um, I'm uh, going to sign off. <laughs>